platforms. Uh, we have a great panel of um, speakers right here who will be discussing global campaign for occupational health and safety, the power of digital education for coffee professionals at origin, empowering youth and the next gen, addressing gender disparities among other very relevant topics. So I uh, request the chair, Mr. Hernan Manson, Senior Officer Sector Competitiveness, International Trade Center, to kindly take over. Honor for all of us here today to be part of this session. We would like to thank you for your time, for being here. We would also like to uh, convey our appreciation to uh, the organizing authorities, to the government of India, to the India Coffee Board, to the International Coffee Organization, and of course, to all of you for being here and for the invitation. Now, today's panel is going to talk about a very important topic, partnerships, collaboration, knowledge platforms, trading platforms, doing business together, doing better business together, doing sustainable business together that work for all. We have a distinguished group of panelists present here today. We together represent different stakeholders from the policy making point of view, from the business point of view, from the producer or producer organization and constituency point of view, and of course, from the uh, United Nations or development point of, of view, private sector as well. And this was done on purpose. One of the key messages that we want to convey today is that no one group, stakeholder, government can solve the challenges alone. No one group, stakeholder can actually take advantage of the opportunities alone. And this is why we have this distinguished uh, group of panelists that represent different perspectives and will share with you today all about knowledge platforms, trading platforms, but most importantly, partnerships. And they will present different case studies, their work, and also why partnerships are important in order to solve the challenges and respond to the opportunities. Now, this panel will be a bit uh, different to some of the other panels that you've seen. We will promote more interaction between the different uh, stakeholders and panelists, and also with you. In addition, I will ask each of our panel members to briefly introduce themselves first and why this topic is important to them. After a very quick round of introduction, we will follow this order. We will go to the presentations. And we will have a sequence of presentations and then open the floor for questions and answers. So once again, it's a privilege and an honor for us to be here and looking forward to interacting with you. Without further, let us start with uh, Mrs. Annette Pencel. Annette, one minute. Who are you and why this topic is important to you? Hello. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Annette Pencel. I'm from Germany. I am uh, the executive director of a partnership platform called Global Coffee Platform. I will share more what we do. Why, is, why are partnerships important? We, we in the coffee sector face really big challenges and we have been talking these days about those. Farmer poverty, climate change, pesticides, the lack of uh, the interest of the next generation in, 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 in using coffee as a thriving, uh, um, meaningful way of future development. So therefore, I think we need partnerships to overcome that and find innovative solutions. Thank you, Annette. Max? Thank you. Uh, I'm Massimiliano Fabian. Uh, I'm here uh, on uh, behalf of my company, which is Demus. It's a small, medium enterprise, innovative enterprise located in Trieste. We do decaffeination. Uh, I'm here to present the project that we brought forward all together with my coffee colleagues in Trieste, together with the Aria Science Park, which is a 
scientific institution in Trieste, uh, in the optic of getting, uh, gaining efficiency for whole companies in a, in a circular economy. Uh, it was to get, to get the best uh, out of every part of uh, our company, since we are pushed by sustainability and pushed by starting from the economical side, getting to the environmental side, obviously considering the social side. I have to say also that I'm here uh, because I'm the chair of the International Coffee Council uh, up to next uh, meeting that will take place uh, Thursday and Friday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Max. And my name is Hernan Manson. I have the privilege to be your chair. I work for the International Trade Center, which is UN, and I'm in charge of the work we do in uh, agribusiness. Thank you. And this topic is very important because I believe partnerships are really the way in which we can solve some of the biggest challenges we face today, but also take advantage of the big opportunities that are there as well. Vivek, welcome. Good evening, everybody. My name is Vivek Gaur. I am heading Ecom India, based uh, in uh, Bangalore. Working with Ecom for the last uh, 20 years in coffee and still trying to learn about coffee. That's the beauty of working in coffee. Every day is a cool day and we try to learn something new. Uh, when you talk about coffee trading platforms, I think probably we can look at maybe two different things. One is the International Coffee Future Exchange, which is a coffee trading platform. And second is the blockchain, where you have the complete traceability all the way from the farm gate till the container, you know, uh, whether it's a price transparency, whether it's supply chain transparency, whether it's a quality, whether it's sustainability, everything is on the trading platform. So there are different kind of trading platforms. So it's up to you, like, you know, the way you look at it. So here I'm going to talk today about the coffee trading platform, which is the International Future Exchange. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vivek. Dr. Bubakar. Thank you. <clears throat> Good afternoon and good evening. Uh, my, my name is Abu Bakr, Ben Belhassan. I'm here representing the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. That's a UN uh, specialized agency in food and agriculture based in Rome, but you also have offices in over 130 countries, including, of course, our office here in India, in Delhi. Uh, I'm the director of the Mark Centre Division. Uh, I think from the name, you would guess what we do. Uh, we monitor markets, we assess markets, we do forecasting, we look at production, consumption, trade, imports, exports, prices, stocks. So we cover so many commodities, uh, including coffee to some extent, but we collaborate for that with the international coffee organizations. We also uh, assist our member countries. We have 194 members. 193 countries plus one uh, member organization, that's the European Union. So we assist those countries in terms of trade, in terms of trade policy, trade agreement, whether that's under the WTO, the World Trade Organization, or also regional trade agreements or bilateral trade agreement. Why I am here, uh, I was invited to, to share with you an experience uh, that we have um, in FAO, uh, which is uh, known as AMIS which stands for the G20 Agriculture Market Information System that was established back in 2011, 2011 uh, following the global food price crisis that char characterized the marks between 2007 and 2010. So I'll tell you that experience, and it's a partnership between 10 international organizations, between the members of the G20, and how that partnership has helped to, to address the challenges facing the, the, the commodities covered by, by the AMIS or the, the, the initiative. So with that, I'll be happy to share the experience there. Thank you. Thank you. Niels? Thank you, Hernan. Um, my name is Niels Haak. I'm Director of Sustainable Coffee Partnerships at Conservation International. We are a global non-for-profit working to protect nature for the benefit of people. Um, we work currently, or have offices in about 30 countries, but work in about 100 countries. Um, and in coffee, we work in three different areas. First of all, uh, we work on the ground with producing communities to balance uh, conservation and protection of nature with sustainable production. Second, we work with uh, a lot of coffee companies, uh, roasters, retailers, traders to work on strategies, sourcing guidelines, uh, programs on the ground, investment strategies, 
uh, that will drive the uptake of sustainable production and put in place sustainability strategies. And third, and, and most relevant for this conversation, we, um, we work a lot in the multi-stakeholder collaboration space. We lead an initiative that is called the Sustainable Coffee Challenge, which I will dive into later. And then we also collaborate very closely with uh, organizations like the International Coffee Organization, but also the Global Coffee Platform. And in, to me, this topic of partnerships and platforms is, is very near and dear uh, to what the work that we do. And to me, the word innovation comes up. I think we can only address some of these key challenges and, and, and issues that we're facing in the sector by innovating and better to innovate together than trying to innovate in siloed and small, uh, small silos within the sector. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Niels. Um, I would like to propose a clap of welcoming and thank you for the panelists. And uh, I would also like to make a link between what we are going to talk here, the importance of partnerships, the case studies that everybody will present with the fact that we are all working together and we all need to work together even more to respond to some of the points that are pressing in the industry in the coffee sector today. Without further, Annette, your presentation. Yes, and you're welcome to go to the podium or talk from, from here. Thank you. So, thank you very much for making me the first speaker to share a little bit more about the work of the Global Coffee Platform and its members. Um, I'm very happy that there are several members in the room of the Global Coffee Platform. A special greeting uh, to you. Now, we have been introduced here. Oh, can we get the Yeah, here. So I'm going to give uh, a few examples of the work of the Global Coffee Platform. But before that, we start with who are we and what are we working for? And then bring these concrete examples. What we as Global Coffee Platform are focusing on is really a thriving and sustainable coffee sector for generations to come. That is the big vision. So that vision leads to the mission of what does that mean? We need to start with the farmers because otherwise we would not, all of us being also consumers hopefully of coffee, we would not be having any coffee in the future. That farming needs to be profitable, so there needs to be farmer prosperity there, but in ways that it's socially uh, acceptable and that we are also taking care of environment. The Global Coffee Platform members have agreed on a very concrete and ambitious goal for 2030. That means achieving transformational change for more than 1 million farmers in more than 10 countries in ways that I will explain. Who are the members? Um, a very diverse group of coffee lovers and coffee businesses and coffee producing organizations uh, all along the value chain. And also we have governments and donor partners and associations and NGOs and coffee certification standards. So you see it's quite a diverse and global and powerful group that is believing that coffee uh, sustainability actually needs to be a shared responsibility. So how does that work? Apart from working with the global group and agreeing on an aligned agenda and a couple of tools that I will explain, there is work very importantly happening in coffee producing countries. You see, we have a network of uh, countries that work uh, in public-private partnership platforms to advance coffee sustainability. You see the countries that are here. I think we have to do more work for having India included here as well. You're most welcome. And I see several of you nodding. Thank you for that. So apart from working with those countries that are already starting to innovate public-private partnerships in collective action, there's a broader network to exchange and share learnings. And this is why we are also partnering with the, global, with the International Coffee Organization, because there are 50 coffee-producing countries and there's a lot of work to be done. I want to recognize our donors and partners. You see them here on the slide because partnerships also mean looking beyond 
the, the, the coffee chain into more partners. Some of them are here on the panel and in the room as well. Now, the, what does that mean, transformational change for more than one million farmers? Particularly looking at farmer prosperity and the way we propose to measure progress towards that is using the living income concept. How? Through a holistic package of support owned within the coffee producing countries and it also looks at eventually making farming resilient and profitable and attractive for the youngsters. We have uh, two strategy tiers. One tier is the local strategy, working with and through sustainability platforms in coffee producing countries. And the other tier, the other strategy is the global strategy, where we have provided the sector tools that are being used by coffee businesses and governments and banks uh, and NGOs alike. So these two strategy tiers are interconnected. At the end of the day, farmers need consumers and consumers need farmers. And we are there in this partnership approach to provide innovative solutions and scale what works and go back to the drawing board if it doesn't work to achieve farmer prosperity. Um, I now share a couple of examples of uh, what we do at the global strategy level. We start there with the question, what is sustainability? What does it actually mean concretely? For me as a farmer or for an exporter or for a cooperative or for a roaster or a trader. So we've asked the members and the broader coffee sector to help us get a, an understanding, a common language of what can profitable, sustainable farming look like and what are the dimensions there in social and economic and environmental terms. That is what is encapsulated in the reference code, which is basically a common language on the foundations of coffee sustainability in very practical terms, bringing it down to earth, making it practical. That tool is complemented by a technical tool called equivalence mechanism, where we can then, as an organization, uh, work with uh, sustainability schemes, certifications, programs, to see are they aligned on this common language. And if so, they are recognized by GCP to be in line with that baseline understanding. That helps to create efficiency and comparability. We have been then also working with the roaster and retailer members of the Global Coffee Platform to encourage them to be more open, more transparent about the amount of sustainable coffee purchased. We just uh, last month released uh, the fourth report, uh, the snapshot report that shows how roasters and retailers are committing to buy more and more sustainably produced coffee to pull to have the pull from the market side. Um, this helps to increase transparency and encourage those companies who are not yet on that journey to buy more sustainable coffee and to share the responsibility for sustainability with the producers to do more. And it provides all of you and all of us here in the conference uh, with more data. We need data to make better business decisions. So this uh, report is freely available and I'm going to share with those who are interested this little card where you can download for your own consumption in different languages some of those tools that I'm presenting. Now, what does that mean concretely for the sustainable coffee purchases that we just published uh, last month for last coffee year? You see on the side the participating roasters and retailers, and I really want to applaud the transparency commitment of these companies to share their data and allow us to aggregate and share with all of you. Interestingly, in the past few years, we have been seeing an increase in the purchasing of sustainable coffee. And right now, this is in metric tons. For those of us who think more in terms of coffee bags, the overall purchased volume is more than 36 million, out of which more than 26 was purchased as, in some ways and forms, sustainable, which is a lot. 
Now let's look at uh, the other strategy pillar that we work with uh, through the country sustainability platforms. Um, GCP members are not working only on moving towards sustainable sourcing, but they are also driving collective action locally. Do you see here the countries where local examples are already happening in different areas, be it on responsible use of agrochemicals or social well-being or youth for coffee? And I have this example here for us from Uganda. Um, the issue is a very low, un optimal yield. Um, farmers are many in Uganda, 1.7 million, and there is also unemployment in rural areas. So what did the members and the country platform in Uganda do? Providing an innovative way to engage young people, give them a training package and help farmers to renovate their farms. We don't have time right now to go into the details, but this is here for you to, uh, to learn more. The goal is long-term prosperity for Ugandan coffee farmers and increased job opportunities. And the approach was very much an out-of-the-box thinking, using existing uh, extension services, but then complementing them with youngsters who are energetic and can find their own business by providing services to farmers. And you see here that the results that were proven in a, a previous experimental project um, are very encouraging. This is not yet done. We are still uh, delivering those uh, um, results, but it looks very good that there is a measurable increase on yield, on income for the farmer, and on employment for young people in rural areas. So how can we take this um, further? Uh, TCP has an ambitious uh, strategy and you see here that there are plans underway to really increase the outreach on solutions for farmers in profitable ways until 2030. I'm looking forward to exchanging more with you and first and foremost learn from the other panelists. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Annette, and also for uh, managing the time. Extremely interesting what you're sharing with us, particularly how uh, you're working on one hand the data and the sharing of data in a pre-competitive way uh, between the different operators and how you're connecting that to uh, sustainability and then collective action at the local level. So thank you for that. We will now hear from Dr. Massimiliano Fabian. Max, the floor is yours. Thank you, Hernan, and uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm here. I'm pressing the start, but it's not working. Uh, as I said, I'm here. Uh, my company is Demos. We are decaffeinators in Trieste. We are part of a, a <coughs> relatively large group uh, of coffee industries uh, based in Trieste and in general in the northeastern part of Italy. I say this because it is important in, in the rest of my presentation. And I will present this, this uh, work on behalf of RS Science Park, which is a scientific institution based also in Trieste, who works uh, on many issues, including sustainability, as in this case. This is an innovative tool for supporting industrial symbiosis in the coffee sector in particular, but industrial symbiosis can be much wider as we will see in the rest of, the, of my PPT. Uh, so we start, uh, let's, let's jump without, uh, no, I'll do it to, to the next one. Uh, first of all, what is industrial symbiosis? Uh, it's uh, in, between two more consists, it, it, it uh, consists in uh, intercompany relationships uh, that involve exchange in many, on many sides. It can involve uh, exchange of water, energy, waste, byproducts, or infrastructures. So we try being together to be more efficient and more sustainable. It includes uh, the process by which waste or byproduct of, of an industry become the raw materials for another one. So outputs that come from one company become inputs from an, for another company, thus cutting costs on one side and on, the, on both sides, I would say. 
So as I said, reducing costs, reducing the use of uh, materials, and diminishing and elimin or eliminating waste, and increasing in the whole competitiveness. We, uh, uh, we started, uh, well, Area Science Park started. Uh, we were partner of this project as, uh, uh, as an industry and as a part of the coffee sector. But uh, Area Science Park started uh, implementing uh, a decision support system uh, to collect data available uh, and uh, uh, linking with georeferenced uh, ge geo tools. Uh, so adding up uh, a geographic information system in order to map the local industrial area because logistics are a key point in this type of uh, projects uh, because we are talking of relatively low added value uh, matters. Uh, it is important also to have participation of the companies and policymakers because in the case, for example, of waste, policymakers are very important players because they will facilitate a lot the work if they are with you. We started with the list of companies located in the area. Uh, the, uh, then the data, economic, uh, uh, and acti uh, economical data and activity. Data for waste, waste data, so what they are throwing away. And infrastructures and polluted sites. So all of this was mapped and in Trieste. And then uh, the, the tool puts together the companies, the primary data, and it becomes something, a platform, where all these data are matched so to get to this industrial symbiosis. It can be industrial, but it can be in many things. I mean, I have seen a symbiosis project in Basel recently uh, between coffee farmers. They put together their efforts uh, to go for common composting of their residues, for example. This is also uh, an economical example. So at the end, you can see that on one side, this was the case of uh, a company that was throwing away its pallets. And another company, and it was paying for it. And another company was searching uh, wood as, as, a, as a supply for furniture. So at the end, uh, in the balance sheet, there was a common saving of 21%, even though there was quite some cost in the logistics for the transport of wood. Because again, we are talking of low value, value, added value, uh, and this, thus the logistics are very important. Uh, the, in this uh, case study, uh, the drivers, main drivers, were the high number of coffee companies in Trieste. So uh, there, were, there, were there was the possibility of putting together uh, volumes. So possibility of identifying specific waste streams to be valorized. There were some barriers. The barrier, first of all, the regulatory barrier. In waste, there you have a lot of regulatory barriers, at least in Italy, but uh, <laughs> in Europe and uh, everywhere. And the other, on the other side, there was the, the barrier was the engagement of companies. You have to find the will of the companies to make the effort to give the data so to, and put together this, uh, the, these elements uh, to move forward and get to the industrial symbiosis. Because up to the point that you don't see the savings, you are reluctant sometimes to lose time on something that you don't see of much of a value. Then, the activities, uh, we, uh, Area Science Park really, and, and with the companies, uh, we worked for uh, involvement of the competent authorities, support from the local or national associations, and uh, starting networking uh, with the user companies uh, to get uh, to these valorizations. This is a sample of the chart that was distributed to the companies uh, to understand what were the outputs and see where the outputs were 
could become possible incomes, inputs. Uh, there another example which, uh, on which RSI and Spark is working together with the whole coffee sector in Trieste, but in the whole Northeast right now, uh, uh, is on silver skins. So putting together silver skins, there are a lot of opportunities to valorize silver skins in, a, uh, in many ways to produce, well, you can produce compots, compost, you can produce pellets, you can go for biogas, paper, composite materials, cosmetics, and whatever other things you can think about and realize. The quantity disposed is relevant, and you can valorize something that normally you would pay for throwing away. Uh, once we have found the, 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 the ways to be exchanged, uh, what does this CC system do? Collects primary data, adds it to the map of the primary data collected, matches input-output, and then you can obtain the first benchmark of the cost-benefit simulation. Future research perspectives are, again, on this silver skin, and, uh, but again, on many other things. Uh, you, you, we are, personally, we are looking to industrial symbiosis also in, on the energy side especially after the energy crisis we had in Europe particularly. What, is, what did we learn with this instrument that is simple, but normally simple things do work? It's the importance of availability, data availability, so the companies again n need to be involved and need to be, have the will to give the data, to understand the possible, the potential that uh, it's behind. So the strong engagement of the companies and of the local authorities to speed up the process and not to pose obstacles. And again, the, uh, the awareness of the companies of the benefits that could come out of the pro from the project. Uh, here you have uh, RSI Spark uh, logo. If you go on it, you might find the project. In any case, you have uh, at the bottom line, you have also my email and my companies website uh, on which you can find me and uh, eventually send me any question you might have on this, uh, on this project that was brought forward in an optic of sustainability. Not only environmental, also economical and consequently social. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Max, for, for this. And I would like to, to make a parallel between the first presentation and the second. In both cases, data was important. Not just data availability, but the sharing of data between different stakeholders. Now, in the second case, in addition, there is a willingness to collaborate by private sectors, as in the first place. And what Max shares with us is a very clear incentive. If we collaborate together, we will save money. We will be able to have better and more efficient industrial processes. We will lower the cost of energy. And there was a crisis. The cost of energy was going up. So from adversity into opportunity by actually collaborating but the collaborating based on data, as well as the partnership system, right? And this role that the institutions played in setting up the system, sharing the information, and linking the different entrepreneurs, right? You also talked about policy. The policy makers as critical in providing that incentive was really a very, very innovative and interesting. In the end, this is where the industry, the public sector, the different stakeholders, institutions work together. And we see clearly, uh, you know, congratulations on, on both cases, and Max, on what you have presented. 
We will continue uh, and come back to, to this later. Now, let me introduce our next panelist, Vivek. Uh, no, it's in, it's in this order. Yes. You want to go next? Vivek, go ahead. And Good evening, everybody, once again. Let me share one interesting uh, story with you. You know, in Bangalore, you'll find every second person working in IT department. So I bumped into one uh, tech guy in the flight, and he introduced himself that he's working in Wipro. And then he asked me, are you also working in IT? I said, no. I'm a commodity trader trading coffee. I could see spark in his eyes. Coffee trader, you're a commodity trader. You know, that's an impression people have. He said, like, my life is very boring. You know, I sit in the office for 8 to 10 hours in front of the computer trying to code, coding, you know. I said, my life is also sim something similar. I also sit in the office for 8 to 10 hours, but I, I try to decode. <laughs> so sitting in India, we try to you know, we worry about what's happening in Brazil more than what's happening in India. We worry about what's the certified stock level, what's the spec fund position, what's happening globally. I think we need to really keep a close eye on what's happening globally in addition to what's happening in India, because everything affects the international market. Coffee is a simply complex commodity, that's what I feel. It looks very simple when you sip a cup of coffee, but it's a very complex commodity. I'm sure you'll all agree. So, Without making it too complex for you guys, I will try to make it very simple. So we're going to talk about coffee trading platform today. I think we all can be proud of being part of coffee because it's the second largest traded commodity in the world after oil, crude oil. And it's the largest agri commodity traded in the world. One of the most liquid exchange for coffee trading is the ICE, International, uh, Intercontinental Exchange. The ticker symbol is for KC, KC for Arabica and RC for Robusta. The contract size is, for Arabica is 37,500 pounds, which is equivalent to 17.01 tons, and for Robusta is 10 tons. Tick size is 0 0.05 cents per pound for Arabica and $1 for Robusta. Anybody has any idea when the first coffee exchange was started, established? When the first coffee exchange started in the world? I can tell you none of us were born at that point of time. 1882. It was first started in New York, Cocoa Exchange, in 1882. Then it moved to New York, Newbot, in 1998. And now it's on ICE platform since 2008. Till 2008, it was open out and cry exchange, like I'm sure you would have seen in Bombay Stock Exchange. Uh, hundreds of traders assembled in a circular platform all use a symbol, like you can see, in case you want, you're a seller, you want to sell, your hand should be facing the buyer. If you're a buyer, your palm should be facing yourself to, towards your body. To define the number of lots, you have to use your fingers. If it's a nine, use this one. If it's more than 10 lots, then use uh, your palm on the forehead. If it's hundreds, then this way. It's so complex, I don't know how did they manage, but it worked for more than 100 years. Emergence of electronic trading platform in 2008. So, you know, like with the emergence of technology, uh, we all got, I think, our mobile, first mobile in year 2000 somewhere. Uh, with technology, with the software, so much change. So, in 2008, there was an introduction of electronic trading platform. What are the benefits for the trading platform? Is it transparent? You have access to the live data on your mobile, on your computer, all the time, real time. When you have access to the online trading platform, you can also have uh, access to the futures, options, and charts on a single platform. You have access to the live market data and trends. You can have charts on your screen. A secure payment gateway, like when you have margin money to pay, when you have profit or loss on your future account, it gets transferred to your account automatically. Or when you have access, you get transferred to your account. And if you have fund margin money, you can transfer it online. Secure payment gateway. Integration with supply chain management. If you can integrate live market screen to your supply chain platform, you can see mark to market PL on your open position, on your inventory, on your open sales, on your open purchases. 
which are the prominent coffee trading platforms as of now. There are two. One is International Intercontinental Exchange, ICE, TT Trading Trading Technology. You can also have access to your mobile. So even if you're traveling, when you farm, you can have access to the live market screen real time. This is how the future online screen looks like. You can see the last and the bid, net change, volumes, open interest, and so on and so forth. If you've not seen it before, I'm sure many of you have access to it. But in case you're not seeing the live exchange, this is how it looks like. This is Arabica. This was on Friday. Market was down. This is Dubuster. Glimpse of a trading platform. I don't know whether I can play the video here, just to show you. There's no. Okay. Maybe you can uh, take a pic of the link. You can take a pic of the link and probably play later on on your mobile or your computer to get a feel like how the online trading platform looks like. Key points of the future contract is a deliverable contract. You can deliver the coffee to the board, or you can take the delivery of the coffee against the long position from the exchange. Participants, the key participants in the future market is the physical traders, like us, roasters, the clients, and in addition to that, their respect funds who have nothing to do with the coffee. They enter into the market one day, they exit from the market one day, make money and get out of it. And we keep wondering what happened to the market overnight. So, uh, you need to square your position before the first notice day. Either you square your position or roll with the next future month. Margin money, so which is about $2,000 on Robusta per lot and $3,000 per lot in for Arabica. So you need to fund the margin money when you have a long or short position. And you have to keep funding every day in case market goes against you. Market intelligence, so when you have access to the live market screen, uh, you can also interact with your broker, and he can tell you about more in-depth knowledge about what's happening, what's the position of the funds, what is his view on the market, with a disclaimer. He won't take the responsibility, of course. Uh, in case you want to sell 10 lots, he will tell you, OK, I'm bullish, maybe wait for two days, but it's your call ultimately. He won't take the risk. So it's with a disclaimer. And weather-related information, what's happening in Brazil, what's happening in Vietnam, and Colombia, and Costa Rica. Contango and inverted market. So normally we talk about this every day in the, in the office. So normally the market should be in contango, as you can see, the green line. The forward market should pay you the carry cost. Normally it's $10 per ton per month for Robusta and one cent per pound for Arabica per month, which is normally considered to be a carry cost. And market should pay you ideally for that. So that's a normal position. That's how normal the market should be have. But sometimes market is inverted, like now. Robusta market is inverted by $150. So in case you are pairing inventory, you have to pay to the market to carry your position to the future month in addition to the interest cost we are paying to the bank. So it's a double hit on your PL like it for us uh, when we carry the inventory to the market. I'm just conscious of a time. This is what in general coffee future looks like. But being in India, are we allowed to trade in coffee future exchange directly? This is what RBI rule says. So from 1st of April 2018, RBI relaxed the re regulation. Till then, it we were not allowed to have future account in India, in Indian books. But they gave a relaxation from 1st of April 2018. We can have future account in India, but we can't trade directly on the platform. It has to be routed through a broker. So you replace the order through a broker, through chat, through phone. You can't have access directly. You can't place the order directly on the trading platform. And you can use it only for hedging purpose. So in case you have 100 tons of Robusta visible, you can sell 10 lots of Robusta equivalent in the future market. You can't buy futures in case you are having a long inventory. Similarly, in case you are short, you can't sell the futures. You have to buy the futures. And you have to submit a report to the to, to authorized dealer, which is AD, your bankers, every quarterly. So you have to show how much was the inventory and what is your future position at the end of the quarter. So they are very, very strict. Uh, in case you want to open an account. I'm not here to encourage you to open an account uh, or have a trading platform, access online. I'm just giving you the 
glimpse of how the trading platform looks like. Uh, orders can be placed through brokers like ABN, Deutsche Bank, DBS, Stonex, etc. Thank you very much. Happy trading. Thank you very much, Vivek, for sharing this with us. And I would uh, like to say it's quite innovative. You started this in 2008, was it? Mm. So you were really uh, ahead of the curve. It is important to say the role that platforms play, right? as in this case, to uh, democratize access as much as possible, Absolutely. right? And it is also very interesting and, and much related to our second and first presentation. There is a willingness to, to collaborate. There is private sector investment, but there's also public sector uh, regulatory effort yes. and alignment. Right? So it's very interesting that as we are progressing in the panel, we are hearing once and once and over again how much is important to have this cross collaboration and alignment in order to, to achieve uh, development or actually expand opportunities or solve challenges. Thank you very much, Vivek, and I would like to invite our next panelist, uh, Dr. Bubakar Ben Belhassen from Food and Agriculture Organization of FAO. Over to you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, good afternoon again. Uh, so as I said before, I will be presenting on something different from coffee, so I'm sorry I will take you away from coffee for a few minutes to share with you an experience with another platform. And this is in the spirit of partnerships and how partnerships of different stakeholders actually can work together to achieve a common objective. My, uh, my presentation is regarding the Agricultural Market Information System, which is a, a G20 system, and it happens also that this year, India held the presidency of the G20, so I think the timing is good also to share with you this experience. So, what's AMIS? In a very brief uh, description, uh, it's a platform uh, that was launched back in 2011, so it's about 12 years old. Uh, it was launched by the agriculture ministers of the G20 and the, the fresh French presidency of the G20, and it was basically, as I said before, in response to the increased spikes in food commodity prices. You may recall what happened there between 2007 and 2010, and also the excessive volatility that characterized the market. So as part of the response from the G20, who are major players in global markets, they have decided to establish uh, this platform. So the platform monitors supply and demand development for the major food commodities. It's basically focusing on four major commodities, which are listed here, and they are wheat, rice, maize or corn, and, and soybeans, and of course, all the related policies. What's the objective of that, as I said, is really to try to enhance market transparencies so all stakeholders, they have up-to-date information, they have credible, complete information to guide their decisions. So this is the basic, and with that, the hope is to reduce price volatility, speculation, and so on and so forth. To how, how the structure in terms is to carry out its function, aim is consists of three main components, and these are the market information group, which is a group of experts from the participating countries who are really knowledgeable about those commodities and what's happening in their, in their countries. The, the second part is what's referred to as the Rapid Response Forum, and they would call this like the political arm of AMIS. Why? Simply because when in times of increased uncertainty, those high-level decision makers, they come together, they try to to make decision, to coordinate their decision in order to avoid or avoid exacerbating the situation. So this is why it is more of a political arm compared to the first one, which is the technical, the technical arm. 
And the third component is the secretary. Of course, you need a coordinator for, for, for this effort. And then this is the secretary that supports all, all this work. Now this map gives briefly uh, the, uh, the participating in, uh, in, 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 uh, in this initiative. Uh, so we have the G20 members plus Spain. This is basically the, 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 the G20, including also the EU members, which participate through the EU, that those that are not direct members of the G20. And to that, um, the countries or the members of the G20 decided to add seven countries that are major players in those commodity markets on wheat, maize, rice and, and soybeans. And those countries, I, very quickly I can go through them, which are Egypt, Kazakhstan, Nigeria, the Philippines, Thailand, Ukraine, and Vietnam. So this comes in addition to the G20 members plus Spain. So in total we have 28 countries or, or, or members. When you look at the right side of, of, uh, of this, the pie chart basically gives you how important these countries are for global markets. So they account for the lion's share of production ranging from about uh, 80% or 79% for rice up to 96% for soybeans. So this is really major players and, and that's the idea to bring them together. Then the, in, the, in, the, in the lower part, I hope you see it of, of the slide, it lists the, what I referred to as secretariat before. And the Secretariat is composed of 10 international organizations, including the organization I work for, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, and we house this interagency secretariat. So we have for, for us, for example, we have the World Bank, we have IFPRI, we have IFAD, we have the OECD, we have WTO, the World Trade Organization. So it's, it's, it's an interagency secretariat, but it is housed in FAO. And that's a little bit the spirit on how bringing all, everybody together. Now, in terms of, um, of uh, providing or what, what are our outputs, what, what we do, so we, uh, we provide up-to-date information on uh, world markets, and uh, this is through a number of products and tools. Here, for example, you see what we refer to, or we call the Amos Market Monitor. This is, provides uh, up-to-date uh, information assessment with forecasts. So we also look, look at short-term forecasts for, for those markets in terms of production, in terms of consumption, in terms of trade, both imports, exports, in terms of stocks, and also in terms of price development. The market monitor also have sections that cover related markets. For example, you will see a section on energy markets, a section on fertilizer market, given the interaction of these markets or the implication of development in these markets uh, uh, for, for, uh, for the commodities covered by the initiative. Um, we have also the, um, the, um, the database, the, um, the, the balances, what we call the balances, basically the supply and demand, which is the upper part, and also we have the policy dat database, which catalog the policy that are relevant to those, uh, to those commodities in terms, for example, export restriction, import tariffs, any changes in policy, it's doc documented there, and also it is important to say that this, all, all these outputs and tools are Ac uh, available or accessible online. So on the AMIS website, you can find all the information there. Now, uh, in terms of um, all other activities, an important component also of AMIS, what we refer to is the technical capacity or technical development. So as part of that, we have a training program or an exchange program. And in fact, we have one with India. We had one also with some other countries. So we receive we receive uh, um, um, staff or officers from, let's say, the Minister of Agriculture who are relevant to the work of Amos, and they are trained. And the idea of that is that when they submit information to Amos, to this platform, we get harmonized information. So the, we compare the same thing among the participating countries. So it's not people refer sometimes to different information, they refer them to that differently. So we try to harmonize, and that's the idea of the capacity development, but also in some of the countries, especially the, the law in, in the terms of developing countries, is to increase the capacity in terms of monitoring, in terms of assessment of markets, in terms of forecasting, in terms of policy analysis also. So this is a little bit the capacity uh, development component. 
Uh, another important second pillar in terms uh, of, the, of the initiative, so in addition in providing information, uh, up to date, credible, complete, and so on and so forth, an important component is this, what we call that the G20, the initiative provi provides a platform for policy dialogue. And especially this is important in times of crisis, in, terms of in, in, in times of increased uncertainty. So these major players, they come together in order to assess the situation and with the idea to avoid unilateral policy decisions. So we have seen how sometimes a country, especially major player, when taking a sudden decision, for example, in, 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 on, on trade, that can impact, that can have huge implication in terms of, of what happened to the world market. So the idea is that this country come together, they assess the situation and to promote coordination of policy. So this is also an important function there. In terms of regular outputs and activities, I'm mindful of the time, so I'll try a little bit quickly, Chair. Uh, as I, I said before, we have the Amos Market Monitor. We have 10 editions per year uh, for the, the, the technical component or the market information group. We, they, they hold two sessions per year and as secretary, we facilitate their, that. And we have also uh, usually one of the meetings uh, or one of the session is held in conjunction with the G20 Agricultural Deputies meeting and in fact, the, the first Amos meeting this year was held in March uh, in conjunction with the first agricultural deputy meeting uh, in India. Uh, we have one session of the Amos Rapid Response Forum. This is more the political side or the political uh, component that, that talks about policies and what should be done. We have monthly updates of food marks database and indicator portal. So on the portal you find all the, the, the updates on that. We have regular dialogue with members and we also we, have, uh, uh, we organize thematic seminars and web webinars, and in fact, yesterday we had one relating to early warning and anticipatory action. So how to increase the predictable power of our system in order to allow anticipatory action and to prevent, uh, and to prevent uh, adverse impacts. Now, recent achievement, I'll go very quickly. This is really to say that the system has proven its usefulness, its utility, both during the outbreak of COVID-19 and also during the war in Ukraine. And in fact, for during the COVID-19, some people also credited that thanks to Amos, the number of countries that have used export restriction was reduced. And also those who use that, the, the, the export restriction was short-lived. So because we, we try to promote against, against that. Also during the war in Ukraine, there was a lot of discussion among the members on how to avoid also um, decisions that can exacerbate the situation, especially these are two episodes of big shocks uh, to, to the market. Um, during the discussion also of the war in Ukraine, it has, has come clear that probably some other commodity or some other uh, inputs, for example, fertilizer, they need to be covered by Amos. So as, as, a, as, as a result of that, we are adding under the Ames umbrella, the fertilizer markets and the vegetable oil markets exactly because of what happened during the situation, the war in Ukraine. Very quickly, these are my concluding points. I will not even try to read them, but I think what I have underlined at the last point is the point that I think I want you to take is the importance of member ownership in this initiative. So this is really, it's a member driven. It is important that the countries are member of this, they, they, they are committed to, to, to that objective. I think this is a good point to, to retain. And my last question, of course, to the coffee community, whether a platform like this could be, could be, could be uh, created for coffee in order to improve transparency. We, we had the discussion about price volatility, about the, the situation with farmers and so on and so forth, whether this could help in the, in the, in the coffee sector. With that, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Bubaker. And <clears throat> you end with a very important point. In the plenary, we were just talking about volatility, among many other things. This is clearly connected, and it can be a solution. It has been in the case of food and food uh, crops. In your case, you're also bringing the attention to the importance of global coordination and collaboration. This starts because of a crisis but it requires global G20 or G70 level uh, coordination partnerships. In the case of Annette, 
we looked at industry, value chain based, and private sector collaboration, and also in the case of Max, we looked at collaboration within a sector at a cluster level, in the territory, right, in Trieste. And I think this is a very important point. It's not one or the other. It's a combination of uh, the three. So thank you for bringing the attention to that. Another point that was very interesting in your presentation was <clears throat> the fact that it's not just coordination. You're also highlighting the importance of technical assistance as a vehicle to enable better policies, better responses, but also capacity building. So I leave it there, and I would like to uh, pass the floor to uh, Niels, Niels Hack from Conservation International. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let's see how this works. Great. Yeah, thank you very much. I would like to start with thanking the organizers for such a wonderful uh, event. Uh, I realize that I'm probably between uh, you're between me and uh, the, the drinks and the events, so I hope you had enough coffee over the last day to stretch it to uh, the last uh, session and last presentation before we do uh, the, the discussion. Um, Bubaka took us away from coffee. I'll make sure to bring us back to coffee, but we will stay with the theme of collaboration. And Bubaka ended on the point of member ownership, and I think that is critical if we're talking about uh, collaboration and collaborative platforms and that's also what I'll be focusing on and I'll dive into a little bit on the, the, the importance of transparency and accountability in the coffee sector to drive um, sustainability forward. So 2015 was a very important year for the, uh, for the world. Uh, this was the year when both the sustainable development goals were adopted and the Paris Agreement was signed in, uh, in Paris. Unfortunately, uh, we're now eight years later and the reports are popping up that we're not on track. We're not on track to meeting the sustainable development goals. We're definitely not on track to, to meeting the climate crisis. And we've talked for the last couple of days about all of these challenges, so I won't repeat too much of that. But one of the things that has also come up in the last couple of days is the lack of funding, the lack of investment. So if we're thinking about the SDGs, the estimated uh, finance gap for the SDGs or the finance need to meet the SDGs by 2030 is 5 trillion US dollars. That's a 5 with 12 zeros. Um, certainly not what I have on my bank account um, and I hope probably not any of you. But I do think that it comes back to collaboration. If we're thinking about what is the type of action that is needed, especially with the, that the clock, since the clock is ticking to meet some of those targets. And more important, what is the, oh, 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 what is the role of coffee in all of this? The slide was missing. Um, so what is the role of coffee in this? How are we going to meet the sustainable uh, development goals and the our contribution to the Paris Climate Agreement. The sector, the coffee sector is really one of the sectors that are poised for action and is probably the, one of the best suited industries that can ma make it work as long as we're committed. So it comes back to the importance of a really committed sector. We spoke about collaboration, bringing everyone together, the importance of data, the importance of technology. But down to earth, it's the true, genuine intention and the commitment from all stakeholders across the sector to make this work. In 2016, uh, 2015, as Conservation International, we launched the Sustainable Coffee Challenge as really a call to action for the coffee industry to make coffee the world's first sustainable agricultural product. And this should be possible. Coffee, the coffee sector should be a kind of flagship for agricultural commodities and that's what we, where we want to go. The coffee industry has been leading the path on sustainability for many decades. I think we can take that next step and that's what we're trying to do through the Sustainable Coffee Challenge in partnership with many others. And again, we all have a role to play, both from the industry side, NGOs, governments, retailers, certification scheme, governments, you name it. Everyone can contribute to making coffee the world's first sustainable agricultural product. And if we think about 
a fully sustainable coffee sector. We think about a prosperous coffee sector that supports and improves the livelihoods and well-being of farming and farming communities. We think about conserving nature in terms of biodiversity, carbon, water. We think about a thriving market where resilient supply in a diversified set of origins can be ensured and all underpinned by a strong market demand. Again, how do we ensure that those demand signals flow through the supply chain, that farmers on the ground get the incentives that they require and, and, and to adopt the practices that we need them to implement on the ground? So we set out a number of 2050 goals and 2025 interim targets around each of those car, um, compass points. For interest of time, I won't go through all of them, but I'll, I'll pause for the ones on planet because I'll get back to that later. So our 2050 goal for, um, for conserve nature, for the planet, is to secure at least 1.5 gigatons of carbon by restoring 2.5 million hectares of tree cover and conserving about 5 million hectares of forest in and around coffee producing landscapes. To break that down and give it a little bit more target that is a bit more inside as opposed to kind of kicking the can to 2050, our 2025 tar target for the sector is to secure 100 million tons of carbon by restoring one and a half million hectares of tree cover and conserve about 500,000 hectares of, for <coughs> of forest. So that's a lot of numbers. What does that actually mean? How do we get there? How do we unlock the type of action that we want to see to drive towards some of those very lofty targets and goals? So in order to get there, we will re require really ambitious commitment and radical collaboration, unprecedented in investments in coffee communities and landscape. And with unprecedented investments, I don't mean a pilot project here and an isolated project there. It's truly bringing, taking that next step, putting competitive advantages aside to address some of these key challenges that we've been hearing about in the last couple of days. And that, as some of the other panelists noted, no single actor can address alone. So an important step for us in this, it starts with commitment. Commitment, tell us what you do. What is your contribution to a more sustainable sector? And don't, don't leave it with just a commitment. Report progress over time. How are you advancing? But also allow for what is not working? What can we learn from each other? What are some of the key themes that partners and, and stakeholders are running into that makes the implementation of these commitments um, challenging and have very clear targets for your individual uh, commitments in place because a, a commitment without metrics, without targets, will definitely not ensure the that we can reach the, uh, the impact that is necessary. And ultimately, by understanding what are barriers, we can connect the dots, we can put partners together to drive the investments and actions that are necessary to drive more ambitious commitments and get kind of up, up our level a little bit. So I'll focus on, on this first piece. How do we increase transparency and accountability? And I was asked specifically to talk about one of the tools that we use, which is called our Commitments Hub. So our Commitments Hub is an online space for stakeholders to publicly state commitments to sustainability and report progress over time. We know a lot of the companies that are part of our community, but also governments have commitments but they are often hidden in CSR reports and are very difficult to find in one place to understand, okay, who is doing what? How do we connect some of the dots? And we ask our partners who are required to state commitments to do that in a smart way. So make sure that your targets and goals are specific, measurable, action-oriented, but also realistic and time-bound. And then track progress over time. And any basically any investment or action that you as a company or you as an organization or you as a producer group do to promote sustainability can be shaped in a commitment. Um, so we, uh, we captured that in an online system. It's a fairly simple uh, survey that you go through to capture your commitment and then we invite you next year to come back and report. 
and we leverage those commitments to, again, identify new partnership, identify where we can work together, and address some of the challenges that hinder our in implementation and that will drive innovation. And annually, we're, we're kind of pulling all of the data that we have in that commitments up, where all of the commitments are combined, into a um, hub report. So we aggregate the data, analyze the data in terms of what, what are the trends that we're seeing, how are we contributing to the different SDGs, uh, what is the reach, what are the key themes, how, how are the different commitments laddering up towards those targets that I mentioned. So we're about to launch our uh, 2023 hub report uh, alongside International Coffee Day. Uh, International Coffee Day this year is on a Sunday. We'll not do it on a Sunday, but next year it will be out. So stay tuned for that. And just to give a very, very high level sneak preview in a couple of high level figures. So currently there are 150, uh, 170 active commitments in the hub, of which 41 uh, were stated in the last year. So we've seen a big uptake in the last year in commitments. Once a commitment is matured, so once it's achieved, they're going to be taken down from our hub we, because we're, we can learn from past commitments and we're doing that, but we don't necessarily want to create a database of old commitments, of, of work that has been done in the past, but really looking at what's happening now. Uh, so 65 of our commitments are set to mature in 2025. So if you think about that, that's the vast majority of the commitments in our hub. So some of the partners really need to um, move forward. So collectively, uh, the, the total investment at farm level of our commitments is about 85 million. Um, that is directed to farm level activities. And 85% of the commitments that are, are tacked to our conserve nature compass point, so that planet compass point, which is again is, is the majority of our commitments. Time is up. I'll wrap up. Um, just to give one example on how this actually works in practice. So we've seen in the last years a, a big surge in commitments around climate around carbon neutrality, net zero, reduction of emissions. But we've also heard through the work that we do in, in, in our working groups that a lot of companies are struggling to, how to find the necessary data to actually measure that. But then also, how do we align on a methodology that we're not comparing apples to apples when we're using different tools? So we're initiating a, a new study to develop carbon footprint baselines for five countries in Latin America. Uh, and bringing together like a, through a crowdfunded study, uh, which is now funded by eight uh, coffee roasters, to start that work. So this is how kind of, we put the heads together of the companies that are all sa facing the same issue to, um, to kind of ad address those barriers and find so common solutions. And then ultimately, of course, we don't want to get stuck at measuring. We want to drive to investments on the ground. So we're actively out there unlocking public and private funding to drive investments in, in landscapes that are looking at climate adaptation and mitigation. So we're actively working with the Green Climate Fund, the Global Environment Facility, to bring some of those examples to the forefront and drive more investments in these type of actions. So I'll leave it with that, with this very simple quote from uh, this Ugandan uh, climate activist uh, saying, your actions matter, no action or voice is too small to make a difference. And I think that counts for everyone in this room today. What you're doing on sustainability matters, but make sure it's heard and make sure that you track progress over time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Thank you very much, Niels, for the presentation, for sharing the inspirational quote, and for bringing the challenge to the table. And I think this is a very key message. We need to challenge each other, each organization. We need to push the objectives, the goals, and we need to be ambitious if we're going to solve uh, impending issues such as climate change. I also want to bring the attention related to the topic of this panel across. Right? You, you mentioned it, but I will mention it even more. <clears throat> the importance of digitalization, the importance of uh, agri-tech, the importance of this infrastructure that runs behind each of the different K 
case studies, communication infrastructure, collaboration infrastructure, digitalization, and how that is essential to make collaborations happen, to connect all of us in one way or the other, talked about matchmaking, about connecting all of us, talked about action. And I think this emphasis on the tech, as well as the human trust element that enables the partnership is uh, extremely important. Now, we have around uh, 10, 12 minutes left. I would like to open the floor for questions. We will collect three or four questions, and then we will have uh, the panelists respond to, to them. Is that OK? Thank you. Over there, gentlemen over there, if you can pass around the, the microphone. So we'll go there, then we'll go on that side. Okay, uh, over, uh, okay, you'll start, sir, and then we we'll go to a colleague from Vietnam. Up to you, you're a guest. Please, our colleague from Vietnam. Thank you. Uh, hi, uh, thanks for the talk, super interesting. So uh, I'm Bao, I'm operating in Vietnam. We, we help smallholder farmers transition to agroforestry, and we do that through different mechanisms, in, including uh, digitization, financing, and so forth. Can you hear? We, we can't hear you, there's a bit of echo. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> Okay, I'll, I'll say it again. So Bao from Vietnam, we help smallholder farmers transition to agroforestry using a financing mechanism. And so the theme that I take away from this talk and also from the conference is data is super important and financing is super important. So my question, perhaps for Annette or, or whoever, right? It's an open question is, can, is there a way that we can link what are the data inputs that we need to prove to financiers that <coughs> if they deploy the money, then mass scale transitions will happen. Because if we need $5 trillion, that's a lot of financing that needs to happen, but you know, financial institutions are gonna request you know, specific data points. So is there a way we can standardize that across the ecosystem of coffee so that we can accelerate this financing mechanism? Thank you. Thank you very much, very good question. We'll have another one over there at the back, gentlemen. <clears throat> so so my, my question may be related. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. My, my question may be related, and uh, I'm responding to that question that the gentleman from FAO, FAO asked, saying, do we need a system for coffee? You know, in the end, uh, I mean, I'm speaking on behalf of all the farmers. Uh, in the end, all sustainability is going to happen at the farm level. But in all the conversations we've had, we've not had anybody focus on any kind of systems or processes that can be introduced at a farm level to help us, all of us farmers know that sustainability is good for business. We all know that if we actually focus on sustainability and run business in the proper way and in a sustainable manner, it's good for our productivity and our profitability. But what we need is systems that tells us on a database basis that what we are doing is correct. On a benchmarkable basis, what we are doing makes sense and on a standards basis, meet standards which are recognized and compensated by the market. On a, you know, so so it's, it's, it's about building an ecosystem and a system for a farmer that actually helps us manage our business better, but at the same time creates a transparency that all of you want, creates the data consistency and you know, that all of you want. It's so easy to do. In this country today, we've seen how you know, transformation of societal change can be done through technology. So, if you want to drive sustainability at a farm level, technology is your lever. And Fabian, with all due respect, doctor, you know, silver skin is such a small component of what we actually throw away as waste. You know, you people have spent so much of money, if you had actually directed that kind of resource to uh, doing, and, and, and even to you, Annette, you also run a lot of projects. If you actually focus on developing systems and processes that actually can be used at a farm level, all of us want to use them. You know, we all want to develop them and use them, but that's what we need. In the, in the whole conversation, and I'm addressing this because there are some senior ICO people, ex-ICO people, and you know, all of you are here. In the whole conversation since yesterday to now, the focus on what systems and process you can actually give to a farmer to improve his productivity, to improve his cost management, to reduce his cost has been shocking. And I'm really hoping that tomorrow is going to give us a, you know, a plethora of ideas on how to do this. 
But if you are talking about collaboration, ICO and this forum has to start collaborating with us farmers. You ha we are closest to it. We believe in what you guys are preaching. But you have to give us systems and process and let us collaborate a little more. That's my plea. It's not a, com it's not a comment, it's a plea. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We all take it very seriously and uh, we are here because of that. One more question. The gentleman over there. It's, uh, it's to the lady. To Annette. Uh, like, uh, uh, she was uh, telling us about the gap, uh, the living income gap, and you, you are trying to reduce it by 25%. So, but what is the living income gap that's presently you have got the data as? So, what's that gap presently? And you, you, you plan to reduce it by 25%. So, how much is the gap? And what do you mean by living income gap? Thank you. Okay, there was one more question over here. I am Krishna Kumar, I am a coffee grower. My question is to my dear friend Vivek. In an intercontinental exchange, how do you affect the physical deliveries and the foreign currency reconciliation? Because multi-commodity exchange allows all that. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we will start with a round of uh, feedback and questions and answers, at least from the panel members. I will give the chance to each one of you to share your thoughts and also answer a, a question. So we will start the other way. Niels, we finished with you. We'll start with you, and yeah. we will finish with Annette. So please, you there sure? was specific Not questions, and then you can also uh, have general uh, points that you want to say in conclusion. Sounds good. Can you hear me? Yeah? Great. Um, I'll respond to a couple of them. Uh, first off, on the financing thing, um, oh, financing. I should say financing question. I think that was a very relevant point, especially as investors are increasingly looking for sustainability impacts. The study that I mentioned where we're trying to develop carbon footprint baselines for five countries in Latin America was actually initially done in Vietnam and Indonesia, where a lot of primary data was collected to really build a robust uh, sample and a representative baseline. So that number is there and it showed a very different outcome based on the primary data than what the companies had been using that was secondary outdated databases, um, which shows that if we have accurate data uh, and showing progress <coughs> over time on that, uh, farmers will be able to show progress against some of those targets and show pr uh, reductions over time in a more accurate way, which would obviously be interesting for um, investors. Uh, the second point, which I would like to respond to, so I mentioned uh, the Green, Green Climate Fund. Uh, it's a large multilateral fund that Conservation International is an accredited agency for. We are currently working on a global program under that uh, fund, which would include five countries, including Vietnam, uh, which would drive a lot of financing into um, climate adaptation and mitigation, uh, both on the grant side, but then hopefully also uh, more commercial, as long as there is sufficient, sufficient pipeline. So that is hopefully a hopeful uh, Hopeful input, and I'll end with um, the point on systems. I think an important, uh, an important approach that we've trying been trying to advocate for is the landscape approach. I think the the work that is currently done at the global level through the ICO or through us or through the GCP or at the national level through these national uh, act, uh, national coffee platforms that the GCP is supporting is excellent to set a global and a national agenda. Now is the question, how do we trigger this down to the, the local level, municipality level, watershed level, you name it, to make sure that what is done at the, at the farm level ladders up into those, those national plans, but also vice versa. So those systems that are being developed, that they can live at a, a more local level as well, 
which comes back to the point uh, from Boubacar, ownership is key. Ownership at the local level is essential. Thank you. Yes, Thank you. Thank you for the question. I think I, I will start from where Niels uh, uh, ended on the system. On the system part, yes, what I presented is, looks probably a little bit on the cloud in the sense it's a, it's a global system. Uh, but th th that's how things work. No, we are, you know, that's what we say, that uh, agriculture is local, it's a local science, however, it gets impacted by global development. So, uh, and, and that's a little bit the aim is of, uh, the, the aim is of aims, the, the, the aim of aims, or the objective of the agriculture market information system is how to bring all, you know, the, the major countries together in order to discuss, to improve transparency, to, 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 to enter into dialogue, to come into common understanding of uh, emerging or interesting policy issues. So this is at the global level. But I would say we should operate at different layers. Of course, from there, we have also some other example, not for the coffee sector, but for other sectors in which we have also what we call multi-stakeholders forums. So you bring together the government, the private sector, uh, farmers organizations, uh, civil society, so many international organizations that are relevant to, to that work, you bring them together and you, you, you discuss important issues and then with the ideas you come up with uh, 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 a recommend, uh, an actionable rec recommendation, so a recommendation that can be applied by the government. So this is a little bit, but the, the, the other layer is complementarity within the country and this is on which I agree, of course, otherwise we will be operating in some sort of vacuum, no? between what's happening globally and what's happening locally. So it is important within the country that we have also this ecosystem that relates the, the various systems together, no? And, and that's, I think, that, that's what we can do as an international organization, of course. I mean, we support countries, we support members in mounting or creating those systems within the country, but we cannot maintain them. I, this is more for the country, but. We, we offer our technical expertise, we offer our knowledge, what could be replicated from other experience, we are very happy to do, but I, of course, and fully agree on this, that we have to have a, basically an ecosystem of those various systems, so we have a holistic approach or a comprehensive approach to address issues and challenges, and with the idea that those ch challenges be turned into opportunities, because that's how, the way we see things. Now we try to be optimistic as much as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for your question, sir. Thanks for your question. To understand your question uh, properly, I think uh, your question was how do we manage the currency risk and... Uh, no, how do you affect the physical delivery in an international coffee exchange and how do you reconcile the foreign currency fluctuations? Perfect. Because in a local, this thing, I think it's Understood. now clear. Thanks for, thanks for your question. Uh, first of all, I think we need to see whether it really makes sense for you to deliver the coffee to the exchange. Because that should be the last resort for Indian coffees, I'm talking about. Vietnam, because the differentials are quite low, it may make sense sometimes for them to deliver to the board. For India, the differentials are, for example, today, Robusta share AB, if I talk about Robusta, is trading at 500 over, London market. So if you deliver to the board, you don't get so much of premium from the, from the exchange. So why you would be delivering the coffee to the exchange, first of all? And then you'd incur the expenses all the way from here, deliver to the one of the European ports, that's another like $100. So why you'd be incurring that much of cost to deliver to the board? You are better off selling it to one of the local traders or the international roasters. And managing the currency risk, so as a physical trader, whenever we buy physical coffee from the farmers or the traders, we hedge two risks. One is uh, market risk, we hedge futures, we sell futures, as well as the currency. So we sell dollar forward. So your currency is hedged at the time of purchase itself. So you don't, you're not exposed to the currency risk, even if you deliver after three months or two months or one year. Hope that answers your question. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I encourage to continue the conversation after. He's staying here. We will have a, a session with you and them. Time's up but I want to give the opportunity to answer to some of the other questions and hear from Max. Yes, uh, thank you, Hernan. Uh, 
silver skin. It's, it's small the quantity. That's why I was t uh, talking about symbiosis. We put together efforts to solve many little problems. Many little problems solved will make some money. And making some money will also, if you prove that you make some money, will also solve the problem of getting the financing. So you demonstrate the financer that you are able to sustain the project economically and it is sustainable also by the side of environment and uh, socially, they give you money for the project, likely, likely, obviously. And third point, uh, again, on small farmers, the ICO and all its uh, participants, to, uh, and I, when I say all of, uh, its participants, I speak about public side and private sector, they are both very well aware of the importance of small farmers and the problems they might have. For example, just in the case of the EUDR regulation, where it was on the table for many times. And it, we are fully aware and we are very careful of the matter. Thank you, Max. Annette. Um, very nice. I think we are very aligned here. Thank you for the question. So on the data points, the question from Vietnam, um, actually, I'm re-emphasizing what uh, Max just said. You know, like the, the big challenge is the farming systems, including coffee in many countries, not in all, is not economically viable. And to make it sustainable, the economic part needs to be there. Then it's easier to, you know, like also attract, let's say, impact, impact or ESG-oriented funding. But you, it need, there, there needs to be a return on investment, and that is where we need to build let's say, through innovation, through public-private partnerships, um, systems that work in this market environment and, and with the realities in the countries. I think what, what I've heard you saying in the other session is very encouraging. I'm happy to take up the conversation outside uh, of the panel. The, the point about uh, the need to focus on the farmer and the need to build a much more conducive ecosystem of services and of access I couldn't agree more. This is why the Global Coffee Platform is putting the farmer in the center of the agenda. Because then we can also solve climate change or climate adaptation in a much better way and also take care of other social and economic concerns. But if we don't start there where actually it hurts and it needs to, farming needs to be, and, and the entire coffee business needs to be attractive for next generations, I think this is where, where the work starts and there we need to basically be more pushy about walking the talk on shared responsibility for sustainability. Because as we all have said, everybody needs to put their piece. There's a lot of talking. We need more collective action and co-investment in areas where even competitors are co-investing, together with government, together with, for example, the coffee board, with the extension services, with the research. And GCP has good examples there. Now we need to scale that and bring it to the ICO so that many more countries can benefit from that with the partners that are sitting here and all of you. A last point here, what is living income and what is living income gap and how to measure that and why on earth are we using this as one way to orient our investments? So there is no simple short answer, the time is up. I'm very happy to take up that conversation outside. Uh, we have also experts here from within the membership who are leading and helping on methodological calculation of living income benchmarks and living income gap. But why are we doing this? It is not very encouraging to say, oh, people just need to get out of it. It's positive to share a thriving, a prosperous vision and then one individual needs to decide what is good for me, right? But there is calculation in the hands of governments to say, okay, what is it that the average population in a certain farming region, here in Karnataka, for example, in Chikmagalur, what would a family need to have a good life? That is very different here in, in Karnataka from my example in Uganda or the other example in Brazil, or in Vietnam, or any, in any parts of the world. So yes, it is more complex because we need data, and it needs to be evidence-based, but that then can drive investments and also policy change to what some of my co-panelists also spoke about from different perspectives. So I think we need to use the new technologies that are there, the regulatory push to provide more transparency, to look at these challenges and turn them into opportunities, 
and then see, okay, so what works for farming systems in a much more resilient way, putting the farmer in the center of the attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Annette. Thank you, gentlemen. Thanks to all of you. You've been a wonderful audience. I would propose a clap for all of us. Thank you for the hospitality. And I will end with one phrase, win-win starts with a farmer. And I think we all agree on this. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I request uh, the audience members to wait for a couple of seconds as we honor uh, the panelists. I request Dr. Gopinandan, Divisional Head, Coffee Board, to kindly do the honors. Please put your hands together as we honor uh, the panelists. Uh, Mr. Hernan Manson, Senior Officer, Sector Competitiveness, International Trade Center. Thank you, sir, for ably chairing this session. Ms. Annette Pencil, Executive Director, Global Coffee Platform. <laughs> Dr. Fabian, CEO Demas. Mr. Vivek Gore, Country Manager, Ecom Commodities, India Private Limited. Mr. Bubaka, Director, Trade and Markets Division, FAO. And Mr. Niels Huck, Director, Sustainable Coffee Partnerships, Conservation International. Please uh, pose for a group photograph. So you 